And if you have any comments for Kim, uh, please just put them in the chat. Then we're gonna transition. I have a video to introduce Graziella that uh, came actually from uh, a national project. And then Graziella is gonna talk to us through a, a, a poem called uh, Il Soin Joaquin. Uh, and I'll show that. And then we'll get to hear how that interfaces with Graziella's story, okay? So Kim, take it away. Hi, well, first of all, thank you, Mike, for inviting me and thank all of you for being here listening to me. Um, so Father Mike, first, I want to know what number are you on the Enneagram? You know, I'm going to tell you my center is the heart center. And my spiritual, one of my spiritual directors said that's more important than the number. Because okay. there's two numbers I have a lot of resonance with. So I don't know which one and which is my wing. I'm kind you of won't, still discerning. You won't tell me which numbers you have resonance with? <laughs> Uh, you don't and, have to three and four three and four okay okay i i absolutely thought you were a four so there you go i'm a nine <laughs> okay um so me awesome. too i'm an intense nine. <laughs> oh, awesome <laughs> okay um so the book i i'm previewing is so you want to talk about race it's by ijoma alua um it's a new york times bestseller it is not written from a, um, a position of faith. Uh, I've read several books about um, race coming from a perspective of how do we as Jesus followers um, address race and racial injustice. This isn't one of those. Um, it's incredibly practical. It is um, very readable and, um, and also funny. Um, she uses a lot of anecdotes and um, I, I enjoyed it very much. Um, one thing, uh, her titles are great. So I'll just tell you a few of the titles of the chapters. Um, is it really about race? What if I talk about race wrong? Um, is police brutality really about race? Why can't I say the N word? What is cultural appropriation? Why can't I touch your hair? Why are our students so angry, but what if I hate Al Sharpton <laughs> and things like that. And, um, and she really just kind of hits briefly on so many different aspects of um, race and racism and, and looking at race as a, um, a white person and a person of privilege and um, kind of understanding the different, I, I know as I read it, it, it was a little bit ouch it was kind of like, oh yeah, I still think that way. I still do that. Um, this is a, a journey and a process for all of us. Um, and another thing I really liked is that at the end of many of the chapters, she had numbered steps for what to do about that. And um, that's really something I need. It, it's okay, I, I can read a lot of books I can listen to a lot of podcasts and have a lot of discussions like this, but if I'm not actually doing something, you know, to make it better, uh, then it's really just all talk. So I really like the practical application of what I can do in my community and in my country to make a difference in systemic racism. Um, because it's, in the end, um, one thing I've learned is it's really not about me and how much I love people or how it's, it's really about systems that are in place and, and that need to be changed. And unless the systems are changed, it, it doesn't matter how nice we are. And it, it doesn't matter how uh, kind we are one-on-one, -on -one. we need to be part of changing the system. So anyway, that's, that's the book. I, I highly recommend it. That's all, that's all I got. Kim, Kim, could I put you in the spot and ask you to say, was there any like particular um, things she said that really got you, where you said, oh man, like I didn't realize I was doing that at all. Um, you know, I think some of the things she said were like, that I had recently heard them other places, so I had those oh man moments. Um, I know one thing that really stood out to me is I was raised in a home um, where my dad said, you know, there's black people and then there's the N word that's how I was raised. And he's like, there's really nice, educated, articulate, wonderful, hardworking black people. And then there's these people. And, um, and my dad, you know, he would say Martin Luther King Jr. was great, but Malcolm X was horrible. 
and and he could not stand Jesse Jackson and Al Sharpton and so basically we tend to tone police we like nice well spoken articulate kind i just that was kind of repetitive but uh black people who know how to present their case in a way that's palatable to us um and we don't like angry black people and um so that that was one thing another thing she actually talked about the model minority myth which i hadn't thought a lot about and i that's probably one that I still need to work on is, is viewing um, people of Asian descent of like, oh, they're always so achieving and so smart and they're so good in math and science and the mothers are always so strict and, you know, they have these perfect, they're the model minorities and, and that too is racism to put a group of people into a stereotype like that. So, yeah. Thank you. I, I read this book really early on out of the, like the 15 books I read and the tone policing thing was the hardest one um, for me, uh, which was like, hey, you get really mad that people are calling you to the carpet because you don't like their tone, <laughs> but you've been stepping on their necks, quite frankly, for generations. So, so think through that a little bit harder, you know, like it was, it was very sobering for me. Exactly. Yeah, me too. I'm super grateful for your sharing. Um, and and uh, somebody asked in the chat the name of the book. It's So You Want to Talk About Race. Sorry, it's backwards. And uh, I didn't do the, I don't do the, um, the author's name justice because uh, I'm, I'm always reticent. I'm going to pronounce it incorrectly. It's Ijoma. It's Ijoma, kind of with a soft J, Aluo. <clears throat> Ijoma Aluo. I had to listen to it about six times. <laughs> How do you spell it? I put it in the chat, Meg. Oh, you did? Okay. Yes. Yeah. And I will tell you the author reads her own book if you listen to it on Audible. And uh, mm -hmm. she reads it with some intonation and inflection that... <laughs> furthers the point. <laughs> That's what I want to say. It's not a flat read. She offers you like a real read of the text as I, she intended to write it. She did. I, I'll say one more thing. I guess one thing that was kind of um, hard to read when I read it, um, just being a teacher and being a mom is um, thinking about the way our school system has, um, has failed children of color. Yeah. And um, the way that they are so often, um, you know, criminalized and pathologized and pushed out. And, um, and when, when we see a white child having a tindrum, timber tantrum and getting violent, then they're a child having a temper tantrum. And when a black child does that, they're violent, they're dangerous. And um, anyway, so that's something I you know, that's something that breaks my heart is to see the way children are, uh, the school to prison pipeline and the way that our school system's failing, failing them. Thank you. Thanks, Kim, for speaking to this book. Again, I found it also extremely thought provoking and, and challenging. So I, I commend it to you all. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Thank you. Grateful that you joined us. Uh, okay, so now I want to introduce a little bit about what Graziella is going to do with us. Uh, how many years has it been since StoryCorps came back, Graziella? It was like 10 years ago. Oh, your mic, you're muted. You're muted right now. I, I'm not sure, Mike, e either. They, the story that they did on, on, my, on my grandma was in... Um, oh, nine. In uh, okay, so it's been a little more than 10 years, yeah. Yes, yeah, yeah. So uh, my name is Graciela Cabula. Um, my maiden name is Barrera, so it's Graciela Barrera Cabula. <laughs> my dad calls me Gracie. Uh, he did when he was alive. It's, it's, uh, it, it's uh, Graciela spelled G-R-A-C-I-E-L-A, -E so Gracie is in there. So he just, he called me Gracie all the time, which was a little, not strange, but um, so, so it was a mixture. I guess my point is growing up Hispanic 
in South Texas, we mixed our languages, we mixed our culture, we mixed everything was kind of a, a mixture. Um, and that was, that was good and it was also not bad, but could be difficult uh, in that it, it became somewhat, you could be called Mexican and be, that was an insult. But um, I, I really wasn't Mexican because I grew up in South Texas when it was, you know, 10th generation, I'm, I'm, I'm 10th generation. So um, uh, it, it was, it could be a confusing kind of time for, for me. Um, the, the, the little town that we came from was called Escandon. No, Mier. Mier, which was on the border. And what, what the Spaniards did is they, they lined up a group of all the vill uh, villages all along from what is now today, Veracruz, what is Veracruz. And, and they lined it, they, they had all these little villages and established pe people in these villages all the way up to El Paso, because they had some idea that the river was going to go through New Mexico, Arizona, and into California, and they could move products. And somehow the Spaniards, that 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 the priests that were up there in California could connect, and there would be this big, this big connection, and the Spaniards would control of that whole region. And I don't, they had some grandioso ideas, but but it didn't turn out so grandioso for the people because um, <laughs> most of us grew up poor, uh, working class, um, mi mixed in terms of the languages being mixed and uh, not having a lot of, of respect at, because our English wasn't perfect, but our Spanish wasn't perfect either. So it was, it was a, it was a difficult. It was a difficult growing up period. Um, however, on the other hand, um, it was also wonderful in that we were in, immersed in two cultures, and 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 grew up experiencing the the Anglo custer, customs and the ex, a, a Anglo as as we referred to English speakers. And the Mexican, and and so uh, so it was a very interesting interesting time for me. Um, you want me to do the story core now? Yeah, I'd like I'd like you to do the story core, Mike. So <laughs> because that really tells about my grandma, and that gives an example of what I'm talking about. Okay, let me see. There's a way I can do this. Oh, I know. Okay, all right. We're gonna do this one. And I'm going to optimize for a video. OK. My grandmother, Adelaida Garza Reyes, she was 44 when she started delivering babies. And before they would see a doctor, the families in the community would come to see her. And I remember the banging on the door, Doña Lalita, Doña Lalita, yes tiempo which meant that the husband was there to tell her that she needed to come. She immediately got out of bed, and she took off her nightgown. She put on her little cotton dress. My grandfather was up making some coffee for her, and she said, No tengo tiempo para el café. I don't have time for the coffee. Cuida la niña. Y me ves cuando me ves. Take care of the child. You will see me when you see me. And she left. She never went to school. She was illiterate. And I didn't realize her illiteracy until I became a little older. One day I was in her kitchen and she was cooking and my grandfather had this medical book and he was reading to her. And she suddenly said, no, Bruno, no entiendo, dime otra vez. No, I didn't understand. Tell me again. And he repeated it. And that's when it first occurred to me, she has learned to deliver babies just by what he has read to her and he has taught her from these books. And she delivered babies till her late 70s, I would say. And I guess as a kid, I never thought about 
what she was doing. She was so brave and so strong, and uh, nothing was going to stop her. My grandmother, Adelaida, got He said that just goes back to the beginning. Basically, the story goes. Oh, is there more? I wondered about that. I thought it was yeah. supposed to be longer, but for some reason, it only come. I could only get that first minute. Yeah. I, I, well, and and let me just tell you how I first how I learned how she became a midwife. Apparently, um, her she had twelve children. And uh, the last one died of polio when he was, uh, I'm not sure, like maybe nine or 10. And she told my grandfather, I will not deliver any more babies, uh, but I will help others. I will help w women to deliver babies. Uh, so not that I, I will never deliver babies, I will help women. So, so she did not read or write. In, in English or Spanish, my, my grandfather wrote in Spanish and, and he could speak a little English, but not a lot. So she took, he took her to a doctor to, uh, that they knew. And she said, uh, doctor, doctor, you know, Lalita wants to learn to deliver babies, but she can't read or write. And I'm not sure how for her to learn. And he gave her, and so the doctor gave my, father, my grandfather some books on delivering babies and said, you can read and write in Spanish. So you teach her how to do it. And you teach her all about the problems that are, can arise and what she needs to do to keep problems from happening. And that's what, that's what he did. And so I remember sitting and, and the first re my first realization is sitting in a little, there was a little step that stepped into the kitchen. And he was reading to her from this book in Spanish. And um, I, I, I suddenly, she suddenly stopped. She cleaned her, her hands. She was making tortillas, at which she seemed to do every day. Uh, and she said, hey, Bruno, Bruno, his name was Bruno, stop. I, I, in Spanish, she said, I don't understand what you're talking about. I don't understand. And, he, and so he said, here are the pictures. Let me, let me show you the pictures. She, so, so he would read the text and show her the pictures. And, and so in order for her to better understand the physicality of, of delivering babies and how babies were made basically, um, and, and how all that happened. So people, so I remember that after that, there would be men, usually it was men, but there were two doctors in town, Dr. Dunlap and Dr. De Hoyos. Well, there wasn't a family in the town that would deliver a baby without Doña Lalita being there. So the, so the doctors would come and the bang, or the husband would come first and bang on the door and they'd say, Doña Lalita, Doña Lalita, yes, tiempo, it's time, it's time. Which meant it was time for her to, to throw her little white dress on and get her little, she had a little medicine bag as I, as I recall it. And, and she had long, long hair. She brushed her hair and she put it in a big bun and she pinned it. And, and she, the last thing she would say to my, to my grandfather, me des cuando me des, you will see me when you see me. Ya me voy y, y te, me, te encargo a, mi, a la niña. I'm leaving and you're in charge of the child. Take care of her. And so she would leave. And uh, I, I, I wouldn't see her until I'd see her, whatever time that was. Um, I guess it's, it's, a, it's a bit of a, a short story for a long story that she became my model for being a woman, I, I guess, um, in terms of what it is you know, you do. You had babies. You were a mother, but you were also more than just a mother. You were a caregiver. You uh, you cooked. Uh, you baked. You you raised chickens because she raised chickens. I didn't raise any chickens ever, but she had, she had chickens. 
um, Tim, help me out if there's anything I'm leaving out. She was, she was in charge of all of that, but she didn't read or write a word in English or Spanish. I mean, uh, she spoke, obviously. I, I get a little, uh, what is the word, speechless about her because um, I, I don't know, I, I don't know much about her be, beyond that uh, and what, how much I loved her and respect her and I stayed out of her way. And, and that was my maternal grandmother. Now, my, my paternal grandfather, by, by grandmother, by my, the mother of my father, her rule was, en esta casa no se habla inglés. In this house, you speak no English. So even though she knew we both, we all spoke English and Spanish, for her, Spanish was the language and you would, you, we were not allowed to speak uh, English in her house. Uh, it, it was so, my, my upbringing was a combination of these two very strong women who had very, very powerful beliefs in who they were and how how their children and their grandchildren were going to be raised. Um, Mike, I, I don't have a lot to say about them in terms of that other than that um, they had an, a tremendous influence in, in me. Um, I grew up speaking both English and Spanish. I was I went to Catholic school. And uh, so um, the Sisters of the Divine Providence were my nuns, and they did something that that no that I don't know of anyone else who did. In the third grade, because we were all Spanish-speaking kids, they gave us books that said "Hecho en España." So, and and I I could read it because I could read left to right progression. I I could read English but I didn't read Spanish or so I thought until I, I read the back of the book and it said hecho en España, which I knew it said made in Spain. So from then, from the, from the third grade to the eighth grade, we, we learned to read and write in both languages. And these were, like I said, the, the sisters of the divine providence. When I went to high school, I could read and write in both languages. I could speak both languages. It was, uh, you know, I don't know what else to, how else to explain my growing up period, um, except for the, for the things that I experienced in terms of racism. I do remember going to a little town called Alice, which was close to San Diego. I grew up in a little town called San Diego. 10 miles away was a town named Alice. And uh, that, that place was primarily English speaking. And uh, my, we, were, we would go, but we do a lot of our shopping there. And one day we were there shopping and um, my, my mother said to my dad, it's, it's um, you know, Ricardo needs a haircut. Let, let's, let's go into this barber shop. And, and she's saying it in Spanish. And to, to have their, his hair cut. And the, and the barber opened up the door and said, I do not cut Mexican hair. And my dad said, it's very hard for me to say that because I was just a little kid. And all of a sudden Mexican hair was dirty or bad. Um, so my dad gathered all, all five of us kids and uh, we went to, into the back to our where we were parked, and we went back home, back home to my little hometown. So that was my first experience of of racism that was really really raw in that town in, in that town named Alice. Also, I overheard one day a, a, a man speaking to another man. They were Anglo men saying that because it must have been a period of time 
when you had to serve anybody who came to a, to a lunch counter and he was very loudly and, and profusely talking about, it. he didn't have to serve anybody he didn't wanna serve. And they were people of color or Mexicans, he was not gonna serve them. And, and we, we just walked past the, t the, the store, the, the, the restaurant. Um, I, I guess, I, I, I don't know what else. When you went to TWU. Then when I went to Texas Women's University, I went to Texas Women's University to school, to, to my university. They did not allow Hispanic girls to room with Anglo girls. It was unacceptable. So you could only room or have a roommate that was that was Hispanic or Mexican, but not not Anglo. Um, it, 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 I remember another time sitting there at Texas Women's University and a girl coming up to me and I was sitting alone at a table and she said to me, say something to me in Spanish. And I said, I just I said, what? And she said, I hear you speak Spanish. So say something to me in Spanish. You know, I'm still, when I say that, I'm still stunned at, at that anybody would say that as if it was some kind of alien or, or came from some other place. Um, I guess those were, those were the, yeah. the primary, the, the, the main experiences that I experienced uh, at, at, oh, oh, also I had to go to speech therapy because I wanted to be a speech therapist. That's what I was studying to be. So in, a in my freshman class, the head of the department, and I don't remember his name, in front of the whole freshman class of, of 2B Texas Women's Universities, speech therapist. He said, Graciela, you have to go to speech because you have a Spanish accent and you can't become a, a speech therapist with that accent of yours. And this was in a class in front of my classmates. So I said, okay. So he told me to leave the class and he took me to somebody's office who was a speech clinician. And all I remember saying to her was, I will not say y'all, and I will not say, what was the other word? I don't wanna sound like the Texan, and I won't say y'all. And she said, that's all right. You're going to sound like you're from upstate New York. And I don't know what I sound like today, do I sound like I'm from upstate New York? <laughs> I, I, I don't know. Um, but um, I, I guess I didn't have a whole lot to say other than these, these incidences that happened in my life that reflected the racism and the, 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 what the, what is it? Huh? Yeah, and now we're gonna go see the we're gonna see the video. I'm very nervous, you guys. This, this is very hard for me to talk about. Um, uh, for whatever that's worth, we have a video to, to, to show, right? Yes, we're gonna show uh, your story, Joaquin, right? Yes, yes. Graciela, that's who I am.
in a world of confusion. Caught up in a world of an Anglo society. Confused by the rules, scorned by attitudes, suppressed by manipulations, and destroyed by modern society. My fathers have lost the economic battle and won the struggle of cultural survival. And now I must choose between the paradox of victory of the spirit, despite physical hunger, or to exist in the grasp of American social neurosis, sterilization of the soul, and a full stomach. Yes, I have come a long way to nowhere. Unwillingly dragged by that monstrous technical industrial giant called progress. And Anglo success. I look at myself. I watch my brothers. I shed tears of sorrow. I sow seeds of hate. I withdraw to the safety within the circle of life. My own people. beyond the dreams of the Gauchupin Cortez, who is also the blood, the image of myself. I am the Maya Prince. I am Netzahualcoyot, great leader of the Chichimecas. I am the sword and flame of Cortez the death body. I am the eagle and serpent of the Aztec civilization. I own the land as far as the eye could see under the crown of Spain. And I toiled on my earth and gave my Indian sweat and blood for the Spanish master who ruled with tyranny over man and beast and all that he could trample, but the ground was mine. I was both tyrant and slave. As Christian church took its place in God's good name, to take and use my virgin strength and trusting faith, the priests, both good and bad, took but gave a lasting truth that Spaniard, Indian, Mestizo were all God's children. And from these words grew men who prayed and fought for their own worth as human beings. For that golden moment of freedom! I was part in blood and spirit of that courageous village priest Hidalgo in the year 1810 who rang the bell of independence and gave out that lasting cry, El Grito de Dolores! Que vuelvo gauchupines! Viva la Virgen de Guadalupe! I sentenced him who was me. I excommunicated him my blood. I drove him from the pulpit to lead a bloody revolution for him and me. I killed him. His head, which is mine, and all of those who have come this way, I placed on that fortress wall to wait for independence. Morelos, Matamoros, Guerrero, all compañeros in the act stood against that wall of infamy to feel the hot gouge of lead that my hand made. I died with them. I lived with them. I lived to see our country free, 
free from Spanish rule in 1821. Mexico was free, the crown was gone, but all his parasites remained and ruled and taught with gun and flame and mystic power. I worked, I sweated, I bled, I prayed and waited silently for life to again commence. and died for Don Benito Juarez, guardian of the Constitution. I was him on dusty roads, on barren plains, as he protected his archives as Moses did his sacraments. He held his Mexico in his hand on the most desolate and remote ground, which was his country. And this giant little Zapotec gave not one palm's breadth of his country's land to kings or monarchs or presidents of foreign power. I rode with Pancho Villa, crude and warm, a tornado at full strength, nourished and inspired by the passion and the fire of all his earthly people. Ah! I am Emiliano Zapata. This land, this earth, is ours. I ride with revolutionists against myself. I am rural, coarse and brutal. I am the mountain Indian, superior over all. The thundering hoofbeats are my horses. The chattering machine guns are death to all of me. Yaki! Tarumara, Chamula, Zapotec, Mestizo, Espanol. I have been the bloody revolution. The victor, the vanquished. I have killed and been killed. I am the despots Diaz and Huerta. And the apostle of democracy, Francisco Madero. black shawled faithful women who die with me or live depending on the time and place. I rode the mountains of San Joaquin. I rode as far east and north as the Rocky Mountains and all men hit the guns of Joaquin Murrieta. I killed those men who dared to steal my mind who raped and killed my love, my wife. I stand here looking back, and now I see the present, and still I am the campesino. I am the fat political coyote, I of the same name, Joaquin, in a country that has wiped out all my history, stifled all my pride, in a country that has placed a different weight of indignity upon my age, old, burdened, back. Inferiority is the new load. The Indian has endured and still emerged the winner. The mestizo must yet overcome. And the gauchupin will just ignore. Uno, dos, one, two, tres, cuatro. I look at myself and see part of me who rejects my father, 
and my mother and dissolves into the melting pot to disappear in shame. I sometimes sell my brothers out and reclaim them for my own when society gives me token leadership in society's own name. I bleed in some smelly cell from club or gun or tyranny. I bleed as the vicious gloves of hunger cut my face and eyes as I fight my way from stinking barrio to the glamour of the ring and light of fame for mutilated sorrow. My blood runs pure on the ice caked hills of the Alaskan Isles, on the corpse strewn beach of Normandy, the foreign land of Korea, and now. Vietnam. Here I stand before the court of justice, guilty for all the glory of my rasa, to be sentenced to despair. Here I stand, poor in money, arrogant in pride, bold with machismo, rich in courage, wealthy in spirit and faith. My knees are caked with mud. My hands calloused from the hole. I have made the Anglo rich, yet equality is but a word. The Treaty of Hidalgo has been broken and is but another treacherous promise. My lands are lost and stolen. My culture has been raped. I lengthen the line at the welfare door and fill the jails with crime. These then are the rewards this society has for sons of chiefs and kings and bloody revolutionists who gave a foreign people all their skills and ingenuity to pave the way with brains and blood for those hordes of gold-starved strangers who changed our language and plagiarized our deeds as feats of valor of the road. They frowned upon our way of life and took what they could use. Our art, our literature, our music, they ignored. So they left the real things of value and grabbed at their own destruction by the greed and avarice. They overlooked that cleansing fountain of nature and brotherhood, which is Joaquin. I must fight and win this struggle for my sons, and they must know from me who I am. I have endured in the rugged mountains of our country. I have survived the toils and slavery of the fields. I have existed in the barrios of the city, in the suburbs of bigotry, in the mines of social snobbery, in the prisons of dejection, in the muck of exploitation, in the fierce heat of racial hatred. And now the trumpet sounds. The music of the people stirs the revolution. Like a sleeping giant, it slowly rears its head to the sound of tramping feet, clamoring voices, mariachi strain, fiery tequila explosion, smell of chili verde, and soft brown eyes of expectation for a better life. And in all the fertile farmland, Plains, mountain villages, smoke-smeared cities.
cities, we start to move. myself. I look the same. I feel the same. I cry and I sing the same. I am the masses of my people and I refuse to be absorbed. I was supposed to start with that, but it did, the whole thing did give, I hope, a, a kind of glimpse at what the life or the life of, of Hispanics has been in this country. Um, and, and for me, there's, you know, my own experience, there's a lot of stuff that was in there that, uh, that reflected my own lifestyle. And I, and I think the only thing that's, that I'd like to say is LBJ meant a lot to, to Hispanics from the standpoint that, that he, the, the, the things he did for education opened a lot of doors for us. And education was the place where we, and for me, for me personally, that's where I got my, my feet, where I, I became a principal. I, done superintendency work I, 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 and, and it was all because of LBJ's laws that have to do with education. So uh, I thank you very much for, for listening um, and for paying attention to this. You've been very kind to me. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Graciela. Does anybody, and remember, if you have any questions or comments for Graciela too, you can put them in the chat or feel free to ask your way. Yeah. Uh, some of the other things that uh, she didn't mention um, is when people came from San Diego to to city of Houston, there were no restaurants that would take them, so they had to pack lunches. Um, there, there was a lot of that type of discrimination very openly uh, throughout the state. Also, the state had a law that on school campuses, you could not speak Spanish. Yes, I, I'd forgotten about that. And, and the, the, the experience of the not having anywhere to eat happened to my uncles and to, to my dad and that generation of, so we, we've come a long way, but uh, we've experienced a lot. So does anyone have any comment, any closing question or any? Anything? Graciela, I just yes. wanted to say that we really enjoyed the video. I had read the poem, but it's very, very powerful when you hear it recited, spoken like that, and okay. seeing all the-, the Yes, yes. Well, I appreciate your having heard the poem, yes. 
uh, uh, it's I've had it for I've have it, I've had it for quite a while. And we got the book and all that. Anything else? Any other comment or question? I wanted to say that uh, Yosoy Joaquin was a key uh, teaching tool for me when I worked in the Imperial Valley as a high school teacher with oh. all Hispanic students. Yeah. Um, right you. down on the border. Um, I was determined to not let them, uh, what is the phrase in the poem, uh, disappear into shame. Right. into the melting pot. I was determined that they would value their history, their culture, their language, um, and bring that with them into the Anglo, Anglo culture. Um, and I think that's why they thrived in my classroom, because they were valued. I'm sure. All of them, their, their entire being was yeah. valued. And I think they learned better in that atmosphere. Oh, so, sure. so Joaquin is very close to my heart. It brings those students back in memory. Thank you very Thank much, you. because I, I figured no one had ever even heard of you, Soy Joaquin. <laughs> so it's such a, it's a good feeling to know that, that, that you've used it in that fashion and that it helped you. Uh, anything else? The other commentary or questions? I have a question, Graziella. Yes. First of all, thank you so much for sharing your powerful story with us. That was fascinating and moving. And I learned so much and learned so much about you, my friend. Thank you. Um, I came in a bit late and I apologize for that. So you may have mentioned this already, but did you have a chance to tell your grandmothers how profoundly they influenced your life? Oh, that's it. No, I, I don't, I, I, I didn't. And that, that is, my mom, my mom knew, um, and but no, I, I never did. And that, yes, they they died uh, in their eighties, and I was uh, well, I was I was a kid, and I and I just took it all for granted. And I guess I never really, really thought about how important. And it was not until I was older that I really recognized. Um, how important it was and how important they were to me yeah, and how much they meant to me. Yeah, so thank you, thank you for asking that. Thank you, mention. Anything else? Thank you. Samuel, I wanna thank you for asking that too. That question really touched my heart. Okay. It makes me realize how important it is for us to tell people right now how they've influenced and impacted us. Yeah. 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 Grazie, Ella. Yes. This is Polly. Um, what, what are your thoughts on ways that we can help what's going on in, in the, the fight for Hispanic equality, I guess? Is yes. The way you say it. I, I, I think when we look around at, at people who cut our grass, who do our housekeeping, who do so much of the labor all around, all, all around us, I think just saying to them, thank you, recognizing their presence, recognizing the fact that they're there and they're contributing to our society, um, and, and, and they will understand much more than you think they will. Sometimes you think, well, they don't, I don't speak Spanish, but they speak more English than you think they do. <laughs> and they understand. Um, that's a beautiful question. And thank you for, for asking that and, and saying, yeah, just, just saying thanks. Just saying thanks to, to so many of them that do so much work around here. Back in, back in 1954, when there was a, when the Brown versus the Board of Education, there was a different uh, Supreme Court case in that year too called Hernandez versus the state of Texas. Her, and Hernandez was, and there was a, an attorney by the name of Gar, uh, Cus Garcia, who, who argued before the Supreme Court that uh, they could not convict Hernandez of, of, the, of, 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 of murder because there were no Hispanics on the jury. And his basis was 
the Hispanics were not a race, but they were a class of people set apart and they are also protected by the 14th Amendment and they won. Yeah, yeah. Gus Garcia was quite an interesting person. Uh, he came to our, my dad invited him to have dinner with us once. So I had the, the, I had the honor to meet him, but he died a very sad death. He was, he became alcoholic he died on a park bench in San Antonio somewhere, uh, but uh, he contributed quite a bit in, in, in the movement. So thank, thank all of you for listening and for being so patient with me because I was awfully nervous about, this, about doing this. It's just like sharing my heart and it's, it becomes very intimate. I it's guess. a wonderful gift you've given us. Thank you. The gift of your heart. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. This is one of those great things to realize, too, is that uh, Dr. Samuel Gladden was instrumental in connecting the Kavulas with St. Thomas during the Icons and Transformation exhibition. And they've landed here. And it's, you know, it's what's amazing to see is like how closely interlinked we are on the screen and um, the efforts of just invitation and art and beauty and, and making a beautiful, wonderful community. So thanks Samuel for getting the, the Kavulas here. Kavulas, thanks for being here. And, and thanks for sharing who you are. It's really, really wonderful. Oh, I love you, Samuel. <laughs> You've done some wonderful stuff. Thank you. Can't wait to see you in real life and all of you. I'm with you there. Well, I am looking forward to seeing you next week. We're going to informally talk about some of the saints in our lives. Again, living or dead, people who have pointed us to larger life and light. And um, until then, if not before. Take care. <laughs>